Amen. You can be seated. Well, it is my uh, privilege this morning to introduce you to one of the most humble and thoughtful scholars that I know. Um, Her theology matches her life. And I count it a blessing to be a friend of hers. Dr. Hanluen Concert Comline teaches church history and Christian theology over at Western Seminary, and she is going to be preaching to us this morning. Would you welcome her to the pulpit with me? A reading from 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wives' conduct when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Do not adorn yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair and by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. It was in this way long ago that the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by accepting the authority of their husbands. Thus, Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You have become her daughters as long as you do what is good and never let fears alarm you. Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they too are also heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. This is the word of the Lord. Accept the authority of your husbands. Be gentle and quiet. Woman is the weaker sex. If you're anything like me, these statements are hard to hear. I can feel my body tensing up, my heart beating a little faster, and my whole person gearing up for fight or flight. In moments like these, I think of origin of Alexandria. In some ways, this third century theologian from Egypt could hardly be further from us. But, as I like to tell my students at Western Seminary, origin made some timeless points. Seek out the stumbling blocks in Scripture, origin said. Does something strike you as strange, unbelievable, or even outrageous? That's just where you should focus your attention. So that's what we'll do today. Be submissive. Be gentle and quiet. You are weak. Where is the good news in these statements? Let's start with submission. Wives, accept the authority of your husbands or submit to your husbands, or be subject to your husbands, depending on your translation. However you translate it, this word is difficult. The Greek verb means literally to be ordered under. Does the Bible say that women are inherently second class? As always, considering context is vital. We can learn about the context of this passage by reading between the lines. Women are being encouraged to submit to their husbands in order that their husbands might be won over to obedience to the word. This tells us that the spouses of these women were unbelievers. How does that change anything, you might say? Well, actually, it reframes everything. To us, A woman having an unbelieving spouse sounds completely ordinary. It's accepted in our contemporary North American culture. But in the Greco-Roman setting this passage addresses, women were expected to follow the religion of their husbands, no questions asked. 
Daring to believe differently from your husband was unacceptable. The fact that Christians encouraged women to convert whatever their husbands thought about it created tension with the rest of society. How could these Christians be so bold as to encourage women to choose to follow Christ even when this involved deviating from the views of their husbands? Christians were wrecking families and thereby destabilizing the whole social order of the empire. So the accusation went. So when we read, wives, submit to your husbands, we have to keep in mind the implicit context. To say that the author advocates the subordination of women is misleading. What we see here is the author counseling women who have already done something regarded by their society as highly insubordinate for their sex. In other words... This verse is saying, given that you've already bucked your husband's authority on the most important thing possible, your faith commitment, let him take the lead in other areas. The submission being encouraged here is the voluntary accommodation of equals for the sake of love. It's a far cry from subjugation. These women are not being urged to submit because they are inferior or even because submission itself is the point. Our text says, Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands so that, even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wives' conduct. And this leads us to a second off-putting feature of this passage, the suggestion that women ought to be gentle and quiet. Let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Here again, context is helpful. Women are being urged to quietness, yes, but to a subversive quietness, a quietness that speaks louder than words, a quietness that upends societal assumptions about how women and men should relate. In a society where men determined the religion of the family, they are being urged by their quietness to exercise spiritual leadership They are to bring their husbands to the gospel by their humble actions. This is quiet submission as a leadership strategy. Quietness is one concrete example of the surprising logic that is at work, again, in the final descriptor we'll consider today, weak. Of all the stumbling blocks we've looked at in this passage, this is probably the kicker. It calls to mind a kind of gender essentialism that makes women out to be weaker per se, rather than weaker in certain respects, in certain cases, in certain contexts. And indeed, the unqualified weakness of women was the assumption in the cultural world of 1 Peter. Leading thinkers of the time, still familiar to us today, all assumed this. Plato, Thucydides, Philo. Women and weakness were considered synonymous. They may as well have said with Shakespeare a millennium and a half later, frailty, thy name is woman. Here again, as with submission and quietness, the author works with assumptions of his culture in a counterintuitive way. The translation, as the weaker sex, is a bit misleading since the Greek actually reads as the weaker vessel. This is the same noun that is used in the famous jars of clay passage. It always refers to something material and is often used metaphorically to refer to the body. So the author isn't saying that women are weaker, period. The intention seems to be to point to the physical limitations of women. The assumption that women are physically weaker is unsurprising if debatable in certain respects. But the key thing to focus on here is how the author goes on to turn this assumption on its head. You would expect weakness to be the cause of shame and embarrassment. But we read husbands are to honor their wives, not despite their wives' physical weakness, but rather precisely because of their physical weakness. Show consideration for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex. The verb translated pay honor 
is the same used earlier in the book when the recipients are told to honor the king. Weakness is cited as a reason for respect, not for exploitation or shame. Submission, gentleness, and quietness, weakness. These stubborn, rough threads wend their way through all of Scripture. We know from Ephesians that submission in the context of marriage is supposed to be mutual. In verse 16 of our passage for today, everyone, not just the women, is instructed to show gentleness and reverence. And likewise, Isaiah 30, 15 famously says, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. As for weakness... What did the Lord say to the great Apostle Paul? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Submission, gentleness, and quietness, weakness. These are not peculiarly feminine. Unconventional as it is to think so, they are simply Christian. And this is genuine good news, for in looking to Christ, we see that submissiveness is not passivity. Gentleness is not cowardice. Quietness is not quietude. And weakness, weakness is never what it seems, for to be weak is not to be watered down or to be wishy-washy, to be weak is not to be sidelined from the action. To be weak is not to be second class. To be weak is to take the perfect spiritual form of power. To be weak is to be God's preferred. To be weak is to be like the God we worship. For the Bible tells us that our Lord born in a backwater of the Roman Empire, submitted himself to the humblest of human circumstances for our sake. It tells us that when falsely accused, he stood quiet without a word, silently proclaiming the good news of our salvation in the unadorned truth of his person. We read there that Jesus Christ, the ultimate stumbling block, is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Let us focus our attention on this stumbling block, our humble Savior. This Christ is a treasure in the weak earthen vessels of our humanity. His power is made perfect in our weakness. As we proclaim, along with the women addressed in this letter, the hope that is in us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Go in peace. Go in peace.